bring up uh, Annette Insdorf right now. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Annette Insdorf, Columbia University film professor, and fortunate to be the Real Pieces moderator at 92Y. Tomorrow is National Voter Registration Day. That makes tonight's discussion and the film all in the fight for democracy even more timely. I hope you've all watched this powerful documentary, which had its global launch on Prime Video September 18th. Amazon Studios also released it in select theaters on September 9th. It features Stacey Abrams, the first black woman to become the gubernatorial nominee for a major party in the United States. The film's focus is voter suppression, a dangerous obstacle to democracy and a constant menace in the United States. All In presents examples from 2018, cautionary tales about voting, whether terribly long lines, broken machines, or vo voters turned away from the polls, including Abrams herself, for dubious reasons. This film also faces our history, which my own background tonight acknowledges with a photo from the 2020 calendar, A History of Racial Injustice. It shows African-American citizens in Alabama waiting in line to register to vote after the enactment of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And here is the trailer for All In the Fight for Democracy. If the power of the right to vote was truly made available to everyone in America, it would change the future of this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, Stacey Abrams! When I started running for governor, we anticipated that voter suppression was going to be instrumental in Ryan Kemp's campaign, and we were right. We've been in line for five hours. They said, you've already voted. Looks like several days ago. No, I would have remembered that. Thousands of people were told no and didn't have the authority to demand better. The lines are insane. We have precinct consolidation, non-training of local election officials. I knew something had gone horribly wrong. The system that is supposed to protect our democracy didn't work the way it was supposed to. States implement voter suppression laws all across the country. Things like new voter ID laws purging. You're knocked off the roll. Gerrymandering. Changing the voting boundaries. Ohio is a use it or lose it state. In the United States, the right to vote is the only right you can lose simply for not using it. Jim Crow 2.0, that's what we're saying. We've got a lot of work to do. When we started as a country, 6% of people were eligible to vote. There's still forces that are determined to keep citizens from voting. Unless we fight for the right to vote, our democracy is put at risk. The fight over voting rights is ultimately about power. The states have figured out how to stop. African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans, the young and the poor from voting. History is never a straight line. It's always a fight. I will not concede because the erosion of our democracy is not right. make history All this power. the vote matters All this power. you belong you have value Makes me want to see the film all over again. <laughs> it is an honor. <laughs> it is an honor to welcome the two directors of All In the Fight for Democracy, especially because I've been admiring their work for a long time. Liz Garbus is the Oscar-nominated director of documentaries, including What Happened, Miss Simone, about blues singer Nina Simone, Love Marilyn, that uses Marilyn Monroe's diaries as a point of departure. Bobby Fischer against the world about the chess genius who gradually succumbed to paranoid delusions, 
The Farm, Angola, USA, The Fourth Estate, nominated for an Emmy in 2018, and the recent HBO series, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. Her feature fiction debut, Lost Girls, premiered at Sundance and was released in March. Lisa Cortez was exec producer of the film Precious in 2009, nominated for six Academy Awards and winner for Best Screenplay, Jeffrey Fletcher, as well as Best Supporting Actress for Monique. I loved the documentary that she produced for HBO, The Apollo, about the legendary Harlem Theater, and I just learned that it won an Emmy for Outstanding Documentary and Nonfiction Special. She started out as a music executive at the Def Jam label and Rush Artist Management. She was also VP of a and at Mercury Records and founded the Loose Cannon label. That gives her a solid basis for co-directing another new documentary, which is currently visible on Netflix, The Remix, Hip Hop X Fashion. So welcome to both of you. Um, and I'm gonna start off with some questions before we take a few from our audience. Um, how did you co-direct? I'm always fascinated by a film that is made by more than one director, whether it's the Coen brothers or Garbus and Cortez. Was it that some of you directed certain segments or that one of you directed a segment that the other one would then edit or revise? How did it work? Shall I start, Lisa? Do you want me to? You start and then pass start. the mic. <laughs> yeah, well, you can see that kind of um, collaboration just in our uh, consideration of one another about answering a question. Um, <laughs> the Yeah, you know, I think that part of the challenge with, with this film was how much ground we had to cover. We started working with Stacy last, um, the end of last summer and um, we had a really big story to tell that we knew we wanted to come out right about now, you know, right? And we're, as you say, we're on the eve of National Voter Registration Day um, and certainly wanted the film to remind people of the struggle that led to their having this right um, to vote. And um, so Lisa and I, you know, Lisa did some of the interviews. I did some of the interviews. Um, Lisa would work, we had two editors. Lisa would work with one of the editors on a certain section. I would work with the other editor on another section and then that we would bring it together that, you know, we would in, interweave them. And then, you know, finally everything would end up with one editor. And then it was, it was um, a collaboration and a back and forth. And um, I think Lisa and I were just very focused on getting this done um, and getting it done, you know, and being excellent. And so we just, it wasn't about ego, it wasn't about who's, it was just like we both did different things at different times and we were in lock sync in terms of our point of view on the story. Right. Yeah, I would like to say, you know, we put our, our hip boots on and um, the advent of COVID, you know, definitely was an interesting factor in the process of uh, making this film, but in many ways it helped us to, with our divide and conquer approach, because there was, you know, hundreds of years that we were looking to condense in a way uh, that uh, really meant that, you know, I'd work on, you know, uh, from reconstruction to the, <laughs> VRA and then Liz would be working on, you know, up to Shelby. And then we'd be looking at Wisconsin and figuring out how we were going to incorporate what was happening there uh, in the spring into the film. Um, so the, it definitely was a hive mind um, and um, in, a, in a very fast moving um, uh, creative process. Well, one of the things that struck me is how you interweave the struggle for women to vote. At what point did that become a primary focus for the film? Well, I think there are, when we look at the our history, there are several, there's seminal moments, you know, there's the inception of our country. Well, first of all, there's we the people and, and which sets up in many ways the, the fallacies of that statement. And then we fast forward to the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, and then the 19th, you know, which is granting enfranchisement to women, but it's unfortunately uh, not extended to African-American women. 
So it, in as we created the architecture of the film, um, we saw that certain amendments spoke historically to beats that had uh, contemporary resonance uh, to the overall thesis of the film. And I noticed that um, among the archives you utilized, USC Hefner archive. Um, Hugh Hefner, forgive me, but I did want to ask about that and, and in general about how much research you did, but how did you discover the Hefner archive and what did it provide? Well, I know the clip, I know at least one clip that came from the archive. I mean, for from my perspective as a director and me and Lisa perhaps was more hands-on in the archival process than I was, but um, I'm generally, at, we're asking for scenes and stories and moments in time. And then we have an archival producer who's calling up the archival houses. I know that one very, very special clip that came from the Hefner Library is one of my favorite in the film, which is um, at the voter registration office in 66, right after, or no, 65, I think, before the Voting Fighting Rights Act, where a little boy who is carrying a flag is um, an African-American boy with a mother or a grandmother or an, an older woman with him. Um, and they are harassing them as they're go coming down the courthouse steps. And this cop actually t picks up this flag that this little boy is holding five or six years old. And he, um, the boy is holding on to the flag so hard that um, it, li it he lifts up the boy who's just holding the flag. I seem to be very badly centered in this frame. And I know as I'm talking, I don't know if um, whoever's running tech on this can can center me because I, I'm not able to. But um, I, um, and that was that clip I had never seen before. I mean, there are these clips that in our, you know, in documentaries that talk about the civil rights movement that are iconic and that we, you know, are kind of touch points, The mar you know, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, for example, never ceases to be extraordinarily powerful, you know, jaw dropping awe at the, the the men and women walking across that bridge. But we've seen it, right? There were there were clips we found at that Hefner Library, like that little boy, um, that were very special. Yeah. Yeah, we we, we really sought to um, do a very deep dive in it to try to find, you know, the the testimonials of the people at the beginning of the civil rights movement. Like people had not really seen those before um, because I think there's a tendency when you are looking at a particular period and there's been other films on the civil rights movement, you don't want people to tune out because they're like, oh, there comes that footage again. And so there was a very concerted effort with our archival producer to, to like go to obscure sources uh, to for those uh, scenes. Sure. And yeah, and also we one of the things we wanted to create was the feeling a bit of you know archival verite. I mean, we could interview folks today in Florida, for instance, who are returning citizens fighting for their franchise back after they've served their time. But you know, what about folks in the '60s or in the '40s, you know, who were fighting for the franchise? So we also wanted to create the experience of you know live history as opposed to a narrator and looking at clips and um, and, uh, and and that was you know certainly one of the approaches of the film. Well, I was also aware that from the beginning you've got very quick cutting. Now, is that more for the sense of urgency or to pack in as much material as possible within a feature length movie? Well, there's, hmm. there's the drama of setting mm -hmm. up the stakes of 2018 because then we kind of could do a very quick pivot into history. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people knew about Stacey Abrams' gubernatorial uh, run, but th for those who didn't, it was important to set up what was happening there and then as a jump off to the historical precedents um, that, you know, are the employed different tactics, but for the same, um, ends. Okay. Um, I, I also was struck by how up to date this documentary mm -hmm. is with Wisconsin citizens voting during the pandemic, 
George Floyd's brother exhorting people to vote, Black Lives Matter protests, and eight hour lines at the June 20th primary. So my question is that considering you were editing up until the last minute, is All In finished? Or is this mm -hmm. a film that you could update <laughs> periodically? You know, I think that, um, I think All In is finished. Um, of course you could update it. The but I think um, I think we should update it when we get a new VRA <laughs> signed, when we have a Democratic Senate. Um, I think that um, since Shelby County in 2013, um, which if you haven't seen in a film, is a, is is the Supreme Court case, which really um, took the heart out or took you know the enforcement out of the Voting Rights Act and really enabled the kind of voter suppression tactics we see today. Until that's changed, the film is complete because these voter suppression tactics, whether it's eight hour lines because um, poll places are understaffed or have faulty equipment or because they've cons closed um, polling places in you know generally black and brown communities to consolidate them people all in one place really to discourage turnout you know those stories yes we have the pandemic on top of it but the story is really the same you know so it's like you know wisconsin could pass a law next month or there could be a court but it's really the same story so it's a story about power finding new ways to retain its hold despite in many, many states being, um, you know, a minority party. And by minority, I mean fewer people as opposed to, I'm not talking about race. Right. Okay. I, I was noticing that most of your interview subjects sit behind this long table, Eric Foner, <laughs> Carol Anderson, Ari Berman. I, why this angle? Are we, are you're we, the first one who's asked that question. What, yeah. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah. Are we going to look at the cat out of the bag, Liz? Uh, should we have the great reveal? Well, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Those were green screen interviews. Okay, I don't know if you knew that by looking at them, but those backgrounds were comped in later, oh, okay. the, the rooms that they were in. And at the, at the outset of this project, we explored working with artists who explore various themes in civil rights and civil rights movement, modern artists, um, as compliments for our interviewees. And we wanted to create depth with that table. Um, we ultimately found that it didn't, the art was so complex and rich that in trying to absorb it, behind an interviewee that wasn't ideal. Um, so we ended up incorporating art, for instance, in our animation, and we've been incorporating it in our campaign. Um, but it, that has something to do, but, but in any case, the table is still useful to have an, 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 you know, to have a physical object within a space, which is actually a, uh, a mirage. <laughs> <laughs> you are the first person to ask us. Uh, and so uh, that's a scoop. Yeah, nobody, nobody knew before that um, it was green screen. Okay, I'm learning all the time, <laughs> but it's true yeah. that in my classes at Columbia, um, I'm constantly exhorting the students to pay incredibly close attention to what's in the frame and what's left out of the frame, of course. But you know, when when you talk about a documentary, for me, it's no different ultimately than talking about a fiction film, and I'm sure both of you are very aware of that because you've worked in both media. Um, you have to not only capture elements and tell a powerful story, you have to find the correct or the, the appropriate visual language so that there's coherence throughout and, and that it builds. And I think that you have succeeded beautifully in doing that. Well, um, you know, an interesting so story is when we, sh we shot plates um, to place behind everyone. And uh, we chose a variety of spaces. They were industrial, they were li there were libraries, there were lofts that uh, had you know, a panoramic view of the city behind. And then Liz and I created this chart with pictures to figure out who was best in each setting. So there, it, it is quite intentional uh, where you see Andrew Young, which is from the, uh, the Brooklyn Library, um, and also for Stacey Abrams, who's in another kind of um, scholarly looking setting at the library. 
Uh, and then where you see Hans von Spakovsky from the Heritage Foundation in a much more colder, austere setting. So I think your, you know, the, your comments about the, f the framing um, tell giving you kind of insight into the characters. This definitely was part of the the process. Good, but in our defense, on the. Hans von Spakovsky is not the only person who's in a loft sort of bare setting. So is, for instance, Stacy's campaign manager, Lauren Grow Argo, or, you know, David Pepper from the um, Ohio Democratic Party. So it wasn't that we were, uh, you know, sh putting, putting folks in spaces to, you know, shape your opinion about them, but there were aesthetic qualities that were complementary to their stories. Right. And I, and I did feel always the a co a coherence despite so much disparate visual material from past and present photographic and interview and it all felt really and despite the fact that there are two directors you know really um integrated in a beautiful way um we're going to also be taking a few questions that are coming in from facebook for example one that came in is what challenges did making a documentary about such a current topic pose for you well i i think we always looked at how the past is prologue to this moment. And um, for those who've had the opportunity to see the film, you know, what is important with, for us with this narrative is the, um, the connective tissue between the current topic, let's say the examination of the passage of Amendment 4 in Florida, which allowed for returning citizens to be able to regain their ability to vote. But we then take that current topic and tie it to um, the felon, um, felony laws in Florida from 1868, which limit, which basically took away the right to vote for any uh, felons or returning citizens. So the, the past and the present, you know, are, are kind of like our two trains running. Right. Um, a, a question that just came in that I'm touched by and I, I want to share with you. Someone asked, any thoughts on how the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg impacts voting rights? Well, um, obviously her passing impacts a lot. Um, RBG wrote the brilliant dissent in the Shelby County versus Holder case that we were referencing earlier in this conversation. Um, that case um, took the, uh, you know, really decimated the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that really um, told states with a history of racial discrimination in their voting laws that if they were going to change their laws, they had to run through the federal government to check if they were going to discriminate against um, any Americans. And um, so that essentially they could not pass racial discriminatory um, uh, voting voting restrictions, racially discriminatory voting description, uh, restrictions. So Barack Obama is elected in 2008 um, and you know various states which had been challenging the Voting Rights Act since the day it was passed in, the, in 1965 um, we're like, well, look, this is our greatest example that, you know, we're in a post-racist America. We have an African-American president. What do we need this Voting Rights to Act for? It's an infringement on states' rights. And, you know, Ginsburg and, you know, ultimately Shelby County, this case, Alabama, they were successful in um, winning this case and, and taking the, um, that pre-clearance aspect of the Voting Rights Act, uh, getting it gutted. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote um, a brilliant line, which I hope I don't butcher right now, which is, you know, just because you're not, you're using your umbrella in the rainstorm and you're not getting wet, wet doesn't mean it's not raining, right? And the metaphor, of course, for if I butchered it enough that, that the meaning is not clear is that, you know, the Voting Rights Act was that umbrella and um, it was keeping you dry. And just because you're dry, doesn't mean it's not raining, which was a brilliant dissent. Um, unfortunately, it was the dissent and, it, and, and the case prevailed. But um, in terms of what it means for voting rights today, 
you know, there is a Voting Rights Act on Mitch McConnell's desk, um, a Voting Rights Act that has been rewritten to deal with the issues that the Supreme Court pointed out in that 2013 case, and he is not bringing it to the floor for a vote, quite obviously. If we have a Democratic Senate in 2021 seated, then that uh, majority leader, a Democrat, would likely bring that Voting Rights Act to the floor. It could then be challenged again and brought to the Supreme Court. Um, and without RBG, um, it's a court that is very inhospitable to voting rights. Um, th the guise <laughs> of their antagonism to these to the Voting Rights Act is states' rights, that you cannot have the federal government in control of state laws like this. But, you know, in Bush v. Gore in 2000, state rights didn't seem to prevail, right? They overruled the, uh, the, the decisions of the uh, Florida state legislature. So in fact, states' rights is, is also a fallacious argument because really a lot of these conservatives just have it out for the Voting Rights Act because it enables more people, more black and brown and poor and young and indigenous people to vote, who are citizens. Right. No, I, uh, I think all of us tonight are painfully aware of the passage of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I, actually, even this past weekend, um, I was attending online uh, Rosh Hashanah services with Central Synagogue, and one of the rabbis was quoting Ruth Bader Ginsburg to acknowledge her passing. And what he said was almost like a line lifted from your film, because she apparently um, officiated at one of the first same-sex marriages. And when asked why she did so, she said, because the constitution was imperfect. It was originally designed for the 6% whatever of white men who owned land, no one else. And now we have to work to keep that constitution, a living thing evolving, mm -hmm. she said. And by officiating at this wedding, um, it is an, an he used the word embraceive act. I would have said embracing, but embraceive. And she was asked what she meant by that word. And she said, it means not grudgingly accepting another and changing, but with open arms. Mm. And I found that so moving. And you know, it, it's something that could have been inside of your film <laughs> as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question that came in. Anyone that you wanted to interview for the film but couldn't or, or didn't? We wanted to interview um, Brian Kemp, <laughs> um, but had no response. Um, Chris Kobach, you know, several conservative voices um, who were, are, you know, leading uh, proponents of uh, these oppressive tactics uh, and uh, they, declined or just didn't respond. Okay. Um, I was also wondering about the films or directors that might have inspired you, especially to make a film like this. Um, I have behind me uh, from Ava DuVernay's The 13th, uh, The Constitution actually, <laughs> which we got at a premiere. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that might've been a film or, could you talk either of you a little bit about that? Well, I mean, as you know, both Lisa and I have a long history of working on films that, um, in you know, inter have the intersection of personal stories and social justice issues. You know, from the farm to the Apollo, you know, to Precious on a, in a whole different way. You know, so um, we've we've been down in this in this space for some time. Um, however, I do think that you know, I do think the Thirteenth was an inspirational touch point for us. Um, it was so effective in distilling a really complex argument. And yeah, you know, one of the stories I've, I've shared with Ava and I've um, shared you know, recently with Lisa is that you know, my daughter who, you know, I made this film called The Farm, right? And it was about six inmates at Angola State Penitentiary. And it's, you know, the film is set and we have this you know, voiceover about it's a former prison plantation. I mean, it's a former slave plantation turned prison farm. And these guys are out working the fields, you know, 80% black with white men on horses and big guns. I mean, you know, it's all in the images. You don't even have to say anything. And, and then I remember my daughter going to 
school and 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 coming and having watched the 13th and she came back and she was like mom the prison industrial complex like she just got it and there was a way that you know that film and its directness right um because i suppose mine had a more kind of lyrical character driven um approach and ava's film in its clarity and focus I'm not comparing them, they're different. They're just different styles of filmmaking. But it, I do think it was extremely effective. And I think it was really effective also for young people trying to grasp a really, really complicated issue. Um, and a lot of people, I think with voter suppression, they kind of think, oh yeah, I know I've heard about voter suppression and you know, I think it exists, but they don't really understand how it functions. And, um, and Lisa and I really felt that, you know, if you made a verite film, say following voters in Georgia or, following just like Stacy's campaign, it would be dramatic and exciting and you would feel those personal stories. But really what was necessary in this moment was to widen the lens and look at it over the course of 200 years and look at it from sea to shining sea. That it is not, oh, it's not just a problem in the South. It's terrible in New York and New Hampshire too, right? Like there's all kinds of ways in which this is functioning. And I think for us, the style of this film was dictated by the necessities of this moment. Um, yeah. You know, I think also with, with voter suppression, um, we, we see how, you know, the monster changes its face through time. And in this moment, a lot of people think that voter suppression is one, not real. Um, there's another school that feels like, oh, it's, it's just, bureaucracy. Um, and there was this need to show, to really to pull back the mask um, and to connect through time the, how it resurfaces and reasserts um, itself, but with the same intention. Um, one question came in. Can you talk more about what it was like to work with Stacey Abrams? I mean, after all, this formidable woman is like the engine of your film. Um, a little bit about that? Well, sure. Oh, oh. well, I, it, <laughs> as you saw, we both got really big smiles as you read um, the question. So, of course, Stacey is our, our North Star. And I think the origin story of this project is interesting. She met with several filmmakers last summer um, because she was looking for a bigger platform to tell this history and to make it a talking point for Americans, um, really to, to, to pull the curtain back. And, um, she was, you know, she didn't want this to be about like Stacey Abrams did not win uh, in 2018. She was very explicit that it was not about greater than her loss was that Georgians were denied this fundamental right. Um, but of course, when you know, so she was like, I'm, I don't want to be centered in this film in any way. Um, because it's bigger than me. And, but of course the filmmakers, Liz and I were, were like, well, she's the spine um, uh, and allows us to pivot in and you know have this emotional center that allows us to access these other moments. Um, so when we shared the cut with her, the, the rough cut, we were very nervous um, because we had kind of, you know, put more, a little bit more of her story in there than I think she expected. But to her credit, um, she put her producer hat on and trusted us as storytellers, but also saw um, how the incorporation of her story affected the historical journey that we took people on. Good. Well. One of the most um, remarkable aspects of the documentary for me is connected to Stacey Abrams and to your choice of a slightly different form of filmmaking, animation. Um, I, I love the sequence where you use animation 
for the guard who refuses young Stacey Abrams and her family entry to the governor's mansion when she's been invited as her high school valedictorian. Could you talk a bit, because it's not that typical for a documentary to include an animated sequence. Well, we, you know, there were several, there were a few sequences in the film which we felt were really emotionally important for which for where, which there was very little visual archive or none. Um, and, you know, as filmmakers, you have different ways to, as documentary filmmakers, you have different ways to a attack that problem. Um, one is talking heads and cutting back to the same still. Okay, that's boring. We're not going to do that. Um, another way are reenactments. Um, but in this film, and as I told, mentioned earlier, we had been exploring collaborations with artists and we were really kind of interested, you know, what is art? It's about giving voice to a, to a person. What is democracy? It's about hearing those voices. Um, and there was an artist who um, we were really attracted to, Diana Ejeta, who, um, you know, we felt like through her hand-drawn images, which we had seen on the cover of The New Yorker and in other places, was really able to convey very, something very powerful, humanistic, and emotional. Um, so there were several sequences. I mean, we started off with a longer wish list of about six, and then we had to cut them to three that we decided to animate along with Diana. Um, and that is the sequence of Stacy, who is valedictorian, who is entitled to go to this party at the governor's mansion, being turned away at the door, you know, what a metaphor that was. Um, yeah, we could have shot the governor's mansion, we could have shot some guards standing there, but what we decided to do was make it about Stacy's point of view on that. You know, the guard becomes really, really large in that moment and Stacy becomes really, really small, you know, and it's like, how, how did that feel? Um, we also used animation for another sequence where Stacy talks about her grandmother and her grandmother telling her with tremendous shame about her fear of um, going to vote right after the Voting Rights Act was passed and not believing that that power was really available to her, that, it, that she could go without violence against her body and vote. Um, and then also the story of Maceo Snipes, who is, is a story, you know, which is, you know, exactly why her grandmother would have that fear. Um, a story of a World War II veteran, African-American coming back who is, who is assassinated for voting in 1946, I believe. Yeah. Um, so those were the sequences in which, again, there was very little archive and we, and we wanted the emotion of the story to come across and Diana was the right woman to do it. Great. I, I, I confess to you that many years ago, I was more of a purist. And when mm -hmm. I watched documentaries, um, well, I always had trouble with reenactments. I still do today. Um, animation, it just struck me as being so out of left field but I have completely changed my mind about that, not only because of your film. A year ago, um, Ask Dr. Ruth, about Dr. Ruth mm. Westheimer, directed by Ryan White. There too, I was quite surprised that in this portrait of a remarkable woman, um, there, was, there were animated sequences representing her childhood during the Holocaust when she was forced to leave her parents. And I remember her saying when I interviewed her at the Tribeca Film Festival, initially she was horrified by the idea of animation for her story. And then she thought it would be like um, a cartoon. <laughs> and then she saw the film and realized how evocatively and realistically this animation made the viewers feel about her life. So it can be done if it's done well. Um, yeah, I think it has to be integrated and have a relationship to the look and the feel of the rest of the film, as opposed to just feeling like some element from outer space. Right. My opinion, yeah. or, you know. On the other hand, I, I very much appreciated how with the end credits, you have something completely different. Figures mm -hmm. like Gloria Steinem and Dolores Huerta speaking directly to the camera with instructions about how to vote. Uh, could you talk a bit about that um, epilogue? Well, I, we, Liz and I were talking and we, and, and, you know, and I think we, we had shared the, the film with some high school students uh, when we were in the rough cut and, and a lot of their questions were like, wow, you know, I'm going to be able to vote and what do I do? Um, and, you know, I think it, it, it's a, a natural coda that we arrive at at the end of the film is, was, is this call to action. Um, and 
working with our um, impact producer, we came up with like, you know, the most important things uh, and almost like a mantra of what people could do. Uh, Cause I think once you've demystified and we've identified the monster, we wanted to give people the tools to fight the monster. Good. And actually that leads me to a question. Could you talk a little bit more about your goals for All In, the fight for democracy? In other words, I, I gather there's an accompanying action plan to reach and educate voters across the United States. Um, tell us a little more about that. Um, want me to jump, do, do, jump in? Well, I, you know, I think we, we always had from the inception of this project a 360 approach. Um, it's about the movie, the movement, the message. And very mm -hmm. early on um, with Dan Kogan, we started working on the social impact campaign and website. Um, once again, to answer those lingering questions about individual rules for your state, because things vary from state to state, what you can do if you think you're a victim of, you know, how you can, you know, once again, fight the monster. Um, and it's uh, allinforvoting.com is the... Um, our, our site, uh, we have, we'll be releasing a curriculum for teachers shortly. We have buses that are traveling through the country that are not only hosting pop-up screenings, but also um, registering people to vote. And as a, a part of this engagement, um, we're really excited to share that for 24 hours uh, tomorrow, the film uh, will be available for free on Twitter, on Twitch, on YouTube, and most importantly, for me, the second time I think it's ever happened at Amazon, it will be in front of the paywall. You do not have to be a Prime member to access the film. And then at seven o'clock tomorrow night, Eastern Standard Time, um, Stacey Abrams, uh, Liz, myself, uh, will be uh, hosting a Twitter watch party and will be joined by Lynn Manuel Miranda. <laughs> None too shabby. Um, congratulations. And what a wonderful gift to be giving United States citizens on National Voter Registration Day. I can't imagine a better way to extend your film um, beyond its initial conception into this uh, vast way of affecting people. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I also had a question, perhaps it's uh, my, my personal thing. I, I, Liz, I knew who your father, I mean, I know who your father is, Martin Garbus. He is such an important figure in American history, a celebrated attorney, author, and First Amendment protector. And I, I can't help but wonder to what extent he was a shaping influence on your work, including a film like this. Mm, well, thank you for for those nice words about him. And um, yeah, I, you know, he before he was a First Amendment lawyer, he was a civil rights lawyer. He worked at the ACLU, um, as did Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of course. Um, and he, one of the early cases he had as a lawyer at the ACLU in uh, nineteen in the mid nineteen sixties was a voting rights case. And that was the case of a woman named Henrietta Wright, who 20 days after the passage of the Voting Rights Act in Mississippi, um, went to the courthouse to register to vote. And she was wearing a black power button. And as she drove, she drove back to the diner where she and her husband, she and her husband ran and they lived behind the diner. And as she's getting out of her car before she could make it inside, sheriff pulls up and throws her to the ground and arrests her and throws her into the car. Um, what is she under arrest for, she asks. Well, she's gone through a stop sign or reckless driving, they say. She says, you know, there's no stop signs between the courthouse and home. I drive this every day. Doesn't matter. So she's thrown in jail overnight. She's beaten. And she is in the next day sent to a mental institution. 
So this was something that, this was a story my father told, it affected him greatly. And you know, as many people know, the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, but it took many, many, many years for folks to be able to vote without the threat of violence. Um, of course, it's not over, <laughs> um, that struggle. But um, so for me, it was something that we talked about at the dinner table. Um, and, you know, part of white privilege is being able to vote without obstruction, um, and uh, and you know to go vote and come back within forty five minutes. But from an early age, I knew that was privilege, not not um, a right afforded to all Americans. So, you know, I would say that when um, after the twenty sixteen election. I was really interested in doing something on voting rights. I didn't know what it would be. Um, and it wasn't until Stacy came to us um, that I was like, okay, that's it. Um, it was really Stacy's idea, but it had been simmering um, because I do think that, um, I think that people have a vague idea about the fight, or, or I'll say white people, I mean, perhaps black folks are more aware of the history, um, but a lot of white folks have the idea that, um, you know, yeah, there have been problems, but it's really like case by case and, and don't have a sense that it's really, voter suppression is a feature, not a bug of the system. And um, between gerrymandering and poll closures and a narrow set of ID laws, that it is quite intentional, as we, you know, and um, widespread. And, and Lisa, I mean, do you actually remember the first time that you voted, and how important has this whole question of voting easily and freely been to you? Um, the first time I voted was with my mother. I must have been four or five, and um, it was a big deal. You know, I was like, why are we putting on our Sunday clothes on a Tuesday? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, um, but my mother t went to great lengths to explain to me um, what we were going to do, the sacrifices that had been made for us to be able to do this. And, um, I, you know, I always remember when she took me into the booth and we talked about the candidates. Uh, of course, you know, it's all wah, wah, wah in my head, but she took her hand in mine and we pulled the lever together. Hmm. And, you know, it's it's a moment like that that has stayed with me forever. Talking about it now, I'm transported back to that time. Um, and, you know, I saw her work, my grandfather's work, you know, just, people in my family who were always advocating for, if not our seat at the table, the ability to build our own house and have a seat at the table. So it was uh, something that was a part of the conversation, but also the actions that they were taking around me all the time. Thank you. Which leads to one of the questions I'm reading from the chat. Um, where do you see hope? Do you see hope? Well, I think that um, the silver lining in all the misinformation that's coming from the administration and Twitter and in Facebook is this real um, about voting and these kind of these this inflammatory language about voter fraud and people illegally voting, which really just is a phantasm. And it's just not borne out by any facts, even even by those appointed by the President Trump himself to study the problem, can't find the problem, right? So I think that the the the, the silver lining about all the trash that's coming out about it is that people are like really and they're asking about it, they're talking about it, and they're getting information. Um, people are aware of early voting. People are aware of absentee or mail-in balloting during a pandemic. Because of this pandemic as well, people are researching their choices. I feel like people are more prepared and planning to vote more so in this election than in any election that I've tracked and followed. Now, I didn't have a film release at that time, but you really hear the way people are talking about voting, that they're really educating themselves about their options. So that, to me, is hope. Um, because I would say so often 
Um, and this is something that Stacy said to us the first time we met her is people show up at the polls, they're told, oh, sorry, you're not registered here. Or in, in like in Georgia, a lot of people were told they'd already voted absentee when they hadn't. They that that they see it as, oh, I must have messed something up. I must not have sent in some form or maybe when I moved, I didn't do this or that. But I think now with all the information coming out, people are armed with the right information. You can request a provisional ballot, check your voter registration. You can do it online. So this is to me what's hopeful because I believe the numbers and the, the goodness is there. It just needs to be counted. Great. Lisa, any addition to that? Um, well, I, I see the hope in, in the changes that we saw in 2018, the midterms. Um, and I see the hope with with um, you know, people who are protesting in the streets, but are equally talking about protesting and showing up at the ballot box. Um, I think never before has this kind, in, in my lifetime, has this language been so much a part of the topics that you're hearing, you know, from the broadest range of people. Um, the uh, This awareness of what has happened and the need to make that plan and make certain that their vote is counted. Yeah. And if I can add a, a personal PS, late last night I watched on Showtime On Demand a new documentary called Surge, which is also co-directed by two women, Hannah Rosenzweig and Wendy Sachs. Uh, Rosenzweig had been Hillary Clinton's personal videographer in 2008. And it's about the record number of first-time female candidates in 2018, who ran, won, and upended politics in the midterm elections. And it focuses on three congressional candidates, for me the most significant being Lauren Underwood in Illinois. Uh, each of the three in Texas and Indiana also, they tried to flip uh, a deep red district to blue. And then Underwood, Underwood became the first, well, she became the youngest black woman ever elected to Congress. And now, too, in this year, we're finding unprecedented numbers of female and Black, Indigenous, people of color candidates who are challenging incumbents whose seats are considered safe or were considered safe. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I would extend the hope, <laughs> you know, into the larger canvas of what your film touches upon. Um, you know, so now one other question that came in. Um, did you talk to John Lewis at all about this film? I don't. I don't know if your timing was such that you were able to, but no, we weren't able to. Yeah, I mean, of course, Stacy knows him and reached out, but I think the timing. He was. He was not um, doing a lot at that time that we were filming. No, and and you managed obviously by including Andrew Young and the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you evoked John Lewis in a most beautiful, respectful way. If I remember correctly, um, I first watched All In just after John Lewis died. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it just, it, it packed that much greater a wallop mm -hmm. to, to, mm -hmm. to have him in that picture. Mm -hmm. um, now we have, I think there's one more question that I saw coming in. We have only a few minutes left. My goodness, I have so many more questions, but um, I'm, I'm just going to ma make one or two points that in reading the materials that you have alongside your film, I found so much that I wanted everyone out there to be aware of. I want to thank you, first of all, for collating information. For example, in your press materials, somebody, you, you have a line, I am a student. Can I register to vote at my school address? And I was shocked. I was shocked to read the next line. Yes, you have the right to register to vote at your school address, including a dorm room. So you're doing something that is so, um, dare I say, socially significant, above and beyond, obviously, the act of making a very fine film. Um, you're using the film to extend into, frankly, illuminating our society, because so many of us have a lot of holes about the, the nature of voting, especially if we've been lucky like me and accustomed to having no problem voting. But hey, I, I have an ID card. There are a lot of people who don't. And your film makes us more aware of those people and how they must be protected, how we have to be 
agitating to some extent in order to make sure that they're protected. Um, in the remaining few minutes, uh, I, I just want to ask if you have any additional points that you'd like to make, knowing that tomorrow is National Photo Registration Day, knowing that your film is finding its way out into the world right now, um, a closing thought or two that we should be taking with us. Um, I will say, check your registration. Even if you think you're registered, even if you just voted, check it, okay? There are problems all over the place. And then the next thing I'll say is make a plan. What is your plan for voting? Are you gonna early vote? Are you mailing it in? Um, do you know where your polling place is? Have your plan organized. Um, and um, I guess, you know, if that's in the film and that that's really what I'd say is the kind of the key thing for right now <laughs> is to check your registration and make your voting plan. Good, thank you. <laughs> and Lisa? What I've enjoyed about this film is that um, history, the history we tell is not spinach. Um, it is um, a history that puts you on the edge of your seat. Um, it, you will cheer at the triumphs and you will shudder at the horror of what we have gone through. Um, and it is great for family viewing and conversation. Um, you know, the it's free tomorrow. Uh, well, actually, all, for 24 hours. Um, and uh, share it with your friends and uh, use it as a tool to help you figure out that plan that Liz mentioned and how you're going to mobilize, engage with other people in your community and um, make certain that your vote is counted. Thank you. And I'll just add, if I may, because usually Lisa does, but I'm gonna do it. If you don't know how to check your registration, if you're not sure where to get these resources, our website, allinforvoting.com will set you up. You can register to be a poll worker on that site. You can check your registration. You can find your polling place. You can do all of that on allinforvoting.com. Great. And I just read a Anurata McGee writes, I applaud you ladies, we need to make voters more educated and documentaries like yours make it good for stimulating the dialogue um and uh and people are thanking you by the way for the inclusive voter registration resource documentary etc um two things i just want to thank liz I, I this is yet another film of yours that i i'm so grateful to you for making lisa i will admit i'm very proud of you because you were my student way back at yale university in the old days <laughs> you've done me proud um, we are very grateful, by the way, to the Campaign for 100%. This particular event is taking place not only within the context of 9 to Y, My Real Piece is Remote, I just finished a, a four-week series on racial justice on film, um, but the Campaign for 100% is an outreach from the Y that is trying very, very hard to educate everyone out there so that nobody has the excuse of, I didn't know where to vote, how to vote, whatever. We can no longer hide behind flimsy things like that when you and others have provided such good information for us. So thank you, Liz. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Julie Mayshak from Campaign for 100%. And all of you who joined us this evening for what for me is a remarkably insightful um, discussion by two formidable filmmakers. So this thank is you and Matt. <laughs> saying good night. Thank you, Matt, for <laughs> introducing me to so many incredible filmmakers and shaping my young mind to go down this path. I am eternally grateful to you. Thank you. <laughs> to both of you and good night to all of you out there. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.